first 17 verses of chapter 13. <clears throat> it says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky, rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown, or has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, Many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So we've uh, reached the, the section of Matthew's Gospel when we begin to see Jesus speak and teach in parables. Uh, parables simply being stories that Jesus would share that would convey a deep or deeper spiritual truth. In this parable, found in the first half of uh, Matthew 13, uh, this parable is commonly known as the parable of the sower, and the parable of the sower is perhaps one of the most understandable parables that Jesus shares, primarily because it's only one of two parables that are recorded in Scripture with Jesus clearly interpreting the meaning of the parable, as we'll see in just a moment. But uh, one of the greatest misconceptions or misunderstandings of the parables is the belief that Jesus taught in parables so that people would have a better understanding on whatever spiritual truth that Jesus was speaking on. Because we often think of parables as a teaching or a preaching technique that Jesus would have used similar to when pastors or, or teachers use illustrations to you know, help their listeners to understand whatever topic that is being discussed. And while Jesus, in this parable and among others, although he does use word pictures that would have been familiar to his listeners, such as things that have to do with, with farming or fishing or money or, or people, uh, the idea that this was a teaching technique that Jesus used to uh, allow his listeners to have a better understanding of his teachings is actually quite the opposite as to why Jesus himself said was the reason why he taught in parables. Now keep in mind, as we read, there was such a large crowd of people surrounding Jesus in the scene. Uh, so much that, or such a large crowd that Jesus didn't even have enough room on the seashore to stand. Matthew doesn't say how many people were here, uh, could have been in the hundreds, uh, most likely in the thousands, as this wouldn't have been uncommon um, in Jesus' ministry, especially in his early ministry. But either way, we see that it's a very large number of people. And I point this out to draw our attention back to, to verse 10 of, of Matthew 13. As we see that it's, it's only the disciples who come up to Jesus uh, after he shares this parable to ask him, why he is speaking in such a way. Of the, the hundreds or, again, perhaps thousands of people in attendance, it's only the 12 men who not only recognize that Jesus is speaking in, in a parable, 
but they're also seeking to understand what the parable means. And this is quite telling, especially as Jesus gives us the reason as to why he chooses to speak in parables. As he says again in verse 11 and 13, speaking to his disciples, he says, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So Jesus gives kind of a twofold reason as to why he is now choosing to speak in parables, why he chooses to reveal the meaning of a, of a parable to his disciples, and why, why he chooses to conceal the meaning of the parables to the, the masses. First of all, Jesus says he reveals the meaning of the parables to his disciples because, as Jesus says, his disciples have ears to hear and eyes to see. In other words, they are receptive to the words and the teachings of Christ. And they know that this parable, among others, but specifically this one, they know that this is more than just a story about some seeds that fell along uh, good or bad soil. Uh, but because the disciples are receptive to Jesus and receptive to his teachings, Jesus will reveal more of the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to his disciples. As Jesus says, he says, you know, their knowledge of God will only continue to grow. They will receive more and more. Whereas the other hundreds or even thousands of people, especially the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they do not have ears to hear or eyes to see. They're as good as deaf to the teachings of Christ and as good as blind to the works that Jesus has been doing in their midst, which is why we read back in chapter 12 that despite the teachings and the miracles that Jesus performed in front of the crowds, many people, again, especially the religious elites, they were not convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Rather, again, chapter 12, they accused Jesus of being possessed by Satan. So Jesus chooses to conceal the understanding of the parables from his naysayers. First of all, as it says, to fulfill prophecy. As he quotes from Isaiah 6, speaking of the unbelievers during his day, in, uh, in verses 14 and 15, he says, You will indeed hear, but you will not understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. So again, Jesus shows us here that concealing the understanding and the knowledge of the parables is a fulfillment of prophecy. Yet at the same time, it's no doubt an act of judgment from Jesus upon those who are rejecting him. For if these people, if these hundreds or thousands of people are only going to continue in their rejection, continue in their unbelief, then Jesus, the Messiah, will simply not waste his time in revealing more truth about the kingdom of heaven to these people who are simply not interested. Yet, I think this is important for us to know, and, and another reason as to why Jesus chooses not to conceal the meaning of, of the, uh, the parables. At the same time, in doing so, it's actually an act of mercy uh, upon these people from Jesus himself. It's an act of mercy upon those who are rejecting him. Because if Jesus was to reveal more truth of God to these people, these people would then become more accountable to the truth that they hear from Jesus. Because as we've talked about many times before, the more we know about God, the higher the standard it will be for us. The more accountable we will be to God on the day of judgment with what we did with the information and the knowledge that we had of God. So if Jesus was to explain the meaning of this parable to these large crowds of people, who these same people are going to just end up rejecting him anyways, they're going to reject the parable, they're only going to reject Jesus in the end, they would only be storing up more punishment for, by, uh, for themselves by continuing to reject more and more of Jesus' revelation and Jesus' teachings. However, as we see in the text, Jesus makes it very clear, whether it's the religious leaders or any person for that matter, if any person who he's speaking of, any person truly desires to know Jesus, that desires to know his teachings and the parables, they would turn to Jesus, he would forgive them, and he would open their eyes to the truth. 
again picking up in verse 15, says, quoting from Isaiah, he says, For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. I would forgive them. So although Jesus clearly explains the, the reason for speaking in parables, it's not as though his heart had grown hardened towards his own people. It's actually the opposite. For his own people, the, the Jews, the, the Jewish race, were the fruit of thousands of years of ongoing resistance towards God and thousands of years of a growing heart that was hardened towards their God. All the way back from the Old Testament and, and the time of the wilderness to the time that they entered the promised land to the time of the kings and the prophets to even now in Jesus' time when their God in human flesh is in their midst, he's in their reach, yet they do not identify him and they do not submit to them. Therefore, Jesus chooses to speak to them in parables. And while he does not explain the meaning of the parables to the, to the masses, to the crowds, he never speaks in a parable without explaining the meaning to his disciples, as we will see in just a moment. But again, before we see the, the, the meaning, the inter interpretation of the parable, we can recall from this parable that there are four different types of soil that is spoken of. The, the hard soil, the, the rocky soil, the soil among thorns, so we we'll call it the, the thorny soil, and then the, the good and fertile soil. And uh, one reason why I, I personally have always enjoyed this parable, enjoyed reading it, enjoyed teaching about it, uh, simply because it's so applicable and so relevant to, to any and all generations. Uh, because we can so easily identify in one way or, or another uh, ourselves in this parable. And without trying to you know, cast judgment on anyone else, oftentimes when we read about this parable, we have people that we know oftentimes come to mind when we uh, see what each type of, of these soils represent. Uh, so with that, we're going we're gonna to read on in verses 18 through 23, kind of go verse by verse, soil by soil. And although it won't be exhaustive, we'll, we'll draw some application on what each kind of, 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 of soil looks like in the real, wor real world. Uh, so regarding the seed that fell on the hard path, the first type of soil, the first type of ground, in which the birds came and ate up the seeds. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 18 and 19. He says, Here then, as he interprets the parable, he says, Here then, the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So in Jesus' day and his time, it would be fair to say that the, the Pharisees and the other religious leaders of his day, they would probably fall under this category. People who are simply resistant towards Christ, their, their hearts are hardened towards him, hardened towards the gospel. Uh, people whose hearts are completely cut off from, from Christ. Uh, people, as Paul would describe in Ephesians 4.18, people who are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of hearts. Yet at the same time, as Jesus implies here in verse 19, our enemy, the devil, he plays a role in this as well. As Jesus says, the seed, which is the gospel, it's the good news of, of Christ, when the seed is scattered, and if the seed falls on to a hard path, Satan or his demonic forces will do all they can do to make sure that the gospel does not penetrate the heart of any unbeliever mentioned in our prayer time uh, before uh, because you know although we see evil in our world in many forms uh, we know that death destruction is, is the love language of our enemy and even though there are various degrees of evil in the world as we see all around us uh, with Satan having much influence with the chaos and evil that we see in our world all that always comes second place to Satan's number one goal which is to deceive the nations to deceive and keep people from saving faith in Christ. And according to Jesus, in regards to this first type of soil, Satan and or, and or at least his, min, his minions are very active in keeping hardened hearts callous towards Christ. 
And, and really the only solution for that, at least on our end, our, our job is to simply continue to cast seeds. Cast seeds, proclaim the gospel, and pray for those wherever that seed falls on. Because anytime seeds are cast out, anytime the gospel is proclaimed, seeds are going to fall on one type of soil or, the, or another. It's essentially good soil or bad soil. And although people, we are responsible to how we respond to Christ, how we, re, how we respond to the gospel, we are held accountable to how we respond. The gospel ultimately cannot come alive in someone's hearts, cannot come alive in dead people's hearts without the intervention and work of the Holy Spirit. And we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So the first kind of soil is hard soil. This could be anyone from a, a devout, stubborn, staunch atheist to a religious zealot of a, of, a, of a false religion or someone who is simply not interested in Christ. This could be someone who was raised in, in the Christian church but is just not at all interested, has never submitted to Christ, and that, that seed, that gospel seed, was never planted in his or her heart. And perhaps at one point in, in our lives, you know, we can relate to this kind of soil uh, in one way or another. Uh, but let's move on to the, the next kind of soil, which is the rocky soil, as Jesus describes in 20, verse 20 and 21. He says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So Jesus is quite clear on what this next kind of soil represents. Uh, this kind of soil represents those who receive Christ, receive the gospel with joy for a short while, but their faith their commitment, their love for Christ does not last. The, the seed may germinate, but since there's not much depth of the heart, not much depth of the soil, the seed eventually dies. And notice in verse 21, Jesus says that this person's faith does not last because he has no root in himself. Take special note of that phrase, that he has no root in himself. This is true for all of us. As, as Paul describes us as Ephesians 2, Prior to Christ, we are, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17 tells us that our human hearts, our hearts are deceitful above all things. And we have Jesus himself say that no one is good except God alone. So because of sin, even, even now as Christians, there's, there's ultimately no good in us apart from Christ. So in regards to this, this parable... Unless God is the one who actually plants that seed in our hearts, in our lives, unless God is the one who grants that seed, the gospel, to come to life and to grow, that seed will not last. Now, God certainly uses men and women to, to cast seeds, to share the gospel, to disciple believers. I mean, this is what God does through the church. Uh, the, the, the church is the avenue by which uh, the Great Commission to go into all the world and claim the gospel is fulfilled. God works through the church, men and women, to proclaim the gospel and to disciple the nations. But it's ultimately the work of God in each individual lives that brings about repentance. It's God's work in that person's life that brings about repentance and faith in Jesus, and ultimately then obedience. So that you and I, we never get to boast in the fruit that is born in our lives or the fruit that is born in other people's lives, so that God alone receives the glory. Paul speaks on this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, 6 and 7, when he says, speaking of, you know, the work of, of ministry, gospel ministry, he says, I planted, so he, he, he speaks the gospel, Apollos watered, Apollos is discipling, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. You know, there's, there's nothing special about the soil in and of itself that Jesus speaks of. In other words, there's, there's nothing special about us that makes us more receptive towards Christ. For God is the one who makes the soil fertile. God is the one who softens our hearts and makes our hearts receptive to him and to the gospel. So then 
the gospel can be planted in our hearts and that God can produce God-honoring fruit in our lives. And the second type of soil that Jesus speaks of and the, the following soil, the, the, the soil among thorns and weeds, uh, they're both very similar to one another, the rocky soil and the, the, the thorny soil. And that both kind of soil represent people who at one point in their life uh, profess faith in Christ, but over time, for, for different reasons, either denounce Christ altogether or simply prove to be a false convert, a false convert. Now, I am one who, when I read scripture, I, I confidently come to the conclusion that you and I, if we are in Christ, we cannot lose our salvation. It's not because of anything in and of, our, in and of ourselves or that we have such profound faith but only because of the promises of Christ and the promises of the cross and the resurrection. The assurance of salvation is found everywhere in the New Testament. And without the assurance of salvation, I'm, I'm not sure any of us would sleep at night. Yet at the same time, we are warned of the reality that people have and people will fall away from Christ. Again, not because they lose their salvation, at least that's not my, that's not my belief, I would say it's because they were never saved to begin with, such as those who are of rocky soil, those who receive Christ for a short time with joy, but eventually over time prove to have never been a genuine believer. They only prove to be a false convert. And I believe the, the gospel of easy believism or cheap grace has been one of the main reasons for this. What I mean by that is gospel that says, you know, just say a little prayer and you become a Christian. You know, God loves you unconditionally, so just say this little prayer and you're in. Now, obviously, we are, we're called to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that, that God raised him from the dead. So the prayer is, is, is obviously important. That's a part of it. It's essential. It's biblical. But what has been commonly known and taught as the, the sinner's prayer, just a specific words that you say and that makes you a Christian, the sinner's prayer is nowhere to be found in Scripture. What we do see in Scripture is the necessity of repentance and faith in Christ. And what we do see in Scripture is that genuine faith in Christ is made evident by our obedience to God. Not that obedience is the means of our salvation, it's not the, the means by which we're saved, but rather obedience is the fruit of of our salvation. It's the evidence of our salvation. So if in relation to this second type of soil, if we are banking our salvation on, on some prayer or some words that we said many years ago, but we have we've noticed really no change of our heart, no change of affection, no internal or even external transformation, then we might be of rocky soil. Perhaps we made some profession of faith once upon a time ago. Perhaps we were even baptized. We We've checked off some of our Christian boxes, um, but if, if, if love for Christ is lacking in our lives, if there is little to no desire for God and the things of God, then, then we may be a rocky soil. We may be a false convert. But as you know, we, we sang in one of our closing songs, if that is true of us, then Jesus is calling on you today. He's calling on his lost sheep to come home to himself, to repent and, and place uh, your faith in him. Uh, make today that day of, of salvation. Uh, so let's let's move on to the third type of soil in verse 22. It says, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So again, similar with rocky soil, the, the seed that is planted among thorns or weeds, it simply does not last. It might last a little bit longer than the, the seeds that fall on, on, on rocky soil, but like the one that falls on rocky soil, it won't last as well. And the other thing that both of these soils have in common with one another is, is the reality that, that both of these soils both represent people who ultimately have a greater love for the world than they have for Christ. For those on rocky soil, as Jesus alludes to, People care more about their reputation than they care about being uh, being accepted by Christ. They'd rather be accepted by the world than by Christ. 
as Jesus says, when, when tribulation or persecution comes their way, because of their faith in Christ, they fall away. And as for those on thorny soil, people allow the, the desires and the, the lusts of the world to over consume their love for Christ. Whether it's blatant sin in their lives or as Jesus mentions here, it, perhaps it's the, the love of money. The love of money and the riches choke out the, the plant as described. Um, and in scripture, money is described as the root of all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil. Money in and of itself is not the problem. Money is paper. It's amoral. It's just a thing. Money's neither good nor bad, but it's what we do with it that, that matters. And we can either honor God with our money by being wise with it, making wise choices, being generous with it as we're called to be, or it can become a God to us. It can become an idol in which we only use money for our gratification and for our pleasure and for ourselves. You know, money money's very powerful. It's just a small little piece of paper for the most part or a little small plastic thing that we swipe. Um, it's kind of like our tongues. We can, we can use it to, to bless, or we can use it to curse. We can use our tongues to either you know, worship God or blaspheme God. Well, similar with money. We can, we, we can use it to bless or to spend it on ourselves and allow it to con consume us. As Jesus warns in this parable, the love of money and the, the pursuit of wealth can choke the fruit out of someone's life and easily apparently lead someone away from, from Christ, proving their faith to have never been genuine. So, whether it's rocky soil, or whether it's thorny soil, the implications are the same. The reality that there will be false converts. There will be those who look the part for a while, but over time prove to have never been saved. Again, whether they completely denounce Christ altogether, or as Jesus says again in verse 22, their lives simply prove to be unfruitful. Uh, for their lives are, are a testament against themselves that they never had faith in Christ. You know, speaking on, on a topic like this, uh, topic of false converts, it's, it's not something that's, that's enjoyable. Don't get excited to talk about it. Uh, but it's something that we're not only warned about in Scripture over and over and over. Um, it's something we witness in our world and, and in the church today. And then speaking of such people, speaking of, of false converts, false Christians, listen to the words of, of John in 1 John 2.19. As he says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Judas is the perfect example of this. And he walked with Jesus the disciples for three years. Judas earned the respect of his peers and, and the trust of his peers. So much that Judas, of all the disciples, he was, part, he was put in charge of the money bag. Even though he was stealing from the money bag, unbeknownst to his fellow disciples. And in the end, none of the disciples would have guessed or assumed or expected that Judas would have been the one to betray Jesus in the end. That's how good of a reputation he had amongst his, his friends. But unfortunately, the, the actions, especially in the, his later years, and the rotten fruit of Judas' life, prove that he never actually loved Jesus. For if he loved Jesus, he wouldn't have been dipping his hand in the money bag, and he certainly wouldn't have betrayed his friend for uh, 30 pieces of silver, for, for greed. But even then, if Judas knew the love that Jesus had, if he knew the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus offers, Judas would have known that Jesus would have forgiven him had he repented, had he turned back to Jesus. But as we know, Judas never repented. Rather, Judas resorted to killing himself in the end. So we can see the, the lack of love and the, the, the rotten fruit of Judas' heart towards Jesus by his rotten fruit that he produced in his life. And we are warned that we will walk among Judases in our lives, even in the church. And perhaps we've been a Judas before. You know, we, we do, and we probably all have Judas tendencies at, at some point. Uh, you know, we, we do, and we say all the right things in front of the right people, uh, but in front of other people, especially in secret, we are living a double life. You know, we are living a lie. And again, if that's true of any of us, again, 
God is calling his, his prodigal child to come back home to him, to receive his love and his forgiveness. Uh, so with that, let's, let's move on to the final soil, the good and fertile soil. In verse 23 of Matthew 13, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. So, <clears throat> what I've always found interesting that you can take two different people, uh, two different people both from, from very similar uh, backgrounds, uh, healthy families, uh, good home life, active participants in a church, they can both even grow up being taught the exact same thing from a, a solid biblical church. But in relation to our text this morning, why is it at times with those two people that, that one person has a continual desire to follow Christ throughout his life and the other person has no desire at all? How is it that two people, both from similar backgrounds, end up on a, on a different path? Well, Jesus gives us the answer here. The seed, which again is the gospel, the good news of Christ, that seed actually took root in one heart and the other, it did not. Despite both people hearing the same truth throughout their upbringing, the gospel came to life in one heart, and the other, it did not. Uh, this is why the new birth, being made, uh, being, uh, being made new in Christ by the Holy Spirit is essential, but it's also why the church also believes in what is known as the doctrine of illumination, or the doctrine of the, uh, the illumination of the Holy Spirit which essentially means that the Holy Spirit must illuminate our minds to the truth of God so that we believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit must open our, our blind eyes to see the beauty of Christ. The Holy Spirit must enlighten us to understand the gospel and apply the gospel for life. Since salvation is the complete work of God from start to finish, the scriptures teach us that the Holy Spirit must enlighten us to understand his word. Because without the internal work of the Holy Spirit, without the new birth, without regeneration, and without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we can sit under biblical teaching for, for years without ever understanding anything. Or at best, at best, we can know it intellectually, but it won't actually bring any internal change of the heart. So we need the words of God to go through our, through our ears, our mind, and be planted in our hearts. And this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. Paul gives us some insight on the doctrine of illumination in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. As he says, the, the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Shortly before his crucifixion, Jesus promised uh, his disciples that he would be sending the Holy Spirit to them. The Holy Spirit to convict them of sin, to, to lead them into all truth, to remind them of the things that Jesus had already taught them. Uh, and this is what the Holy Spirit does to all of us in illuminating our minds to biblical truth. It's not that the Holy Spirit teaches us anything that is, that's different than what's already been recorded and what is plain in Scripture. This is important for us to know especially in a time when we have church leaders who try to divorce uh, the person of the Holy Spirit with his written word. Uh, we cannot do that. We cannot separate the Holy Spirit with what the Spirit has spoken of in Scripture because what the Holy Spirit does is that he brings to life what has already been communicated in his word. He enlightens our minds so that we can understand his word and that we can apply his word properly in our lives. Again, Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians uh, 2, 12 through 14. And saying, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, there's, there's nothing significant about the soil. In other words, there's nothing significant about us. There's nothing that we can do in our natural flesh that makes us more receptive to the gospel than other people. It is only by the grace and the work of the Holy Spirit who makes our hearts receptive to Christ 
who transforms our hearts and makes our hearts fertile for ongoing spiritual growth, which then brings about godly fruit in our lives. And again, it's the, it's the fruit that is born out of our lives, which is the evidence of our salvation. And it's the evidential work that the Holy Spirit is alive in us. And I don't think for a second that you and I, that we will ever reach perfection or that we're always going to nail it uh, because we won't. And don't get discouraged when you still find yourself wrestling with sin in your life or when you find your old self coming out once in a while. Sin is not a, is not a sign that we're not saved. Uh, but if you're bothered by your sin, if, you have a, if, if you've grown to hate your sin, then you should rejoice because that is a sign you're saved. And it's a sign that God is sanctifying you right now. Because prior to your life in Christ, you did not give a second thought to your sin. Sin caused little to no reaction in your life. But now that you have God residing in you, you don't view, this, you don't view sin the same way. And you don't view God the same way either. For you've grown to hate your sin. And you've grown to love God. You have a growing desire to please God. Not to merit or earn salvation, but simply because you know he loves you and you love him. And and if you were to ask any of us in here this question right now, the question of, are you satisfied with where you are spiritually? Are you satisfied with where you are spiritually in your walk with Christ? I think all of us would say no. I think we all say that we wish we were more wise, more disciplined, that there was less sin in us, that we had a growing desire for, for, for prayer and for, for God's word in our lives. Because the reality is that our, our spiritual walk, our spiritual maturity in life is probably not going to look like this. It's probably going to look more, you know, like this, with, with ups and downs, spiritual highs, spiritual lows, um, but ultimately an upward, an upward trajectory. Because this is what God does in us. He sanctifies us. He brings to light hidden sin in our lives, brings conviction to that sin, and produces godly character in our lives. And as Jesus alludes to in verse 23, the amount of fruit that's produced in our lives is not going to be the same across the board. Some will bear more fruit, some will bear less. As Jesus says, some will yield a hundredfold, some 60, others 30. But at the end of the day, it is God who's the one who produces the fruit. So if you produce a hundredfold, you don't get to boast in that fruit. If you produce 30, it doesn't mean you're less valuable in the eyes of God. What does matter is that God has saved you, he's sanctifying you, and he is producing fruit in our lives. Not just for our benefit, but ultimately for his glory. So to close, the question, the question we have to ask ourselves, in honesty, in humility, is where do we find ourselves in this parable? Are we of the hardened path? Are we completely resistant and closed off to Christ? Well, if that's true, then, then we need to pray that God would soften our hearts because we cannot soften our own hearts. We need him to do so. Or are we of the rocky soil? Is there a brief moment in our lives when we receive Christ with joy, but when we are faced with the pressures of the world, pressures of other people, we realize that our reputation was more important? Or are we of the, the thorny soil? Have we deceived ourselves into believing that we are saved, but... When we examine our lives, we realize that there is little to no desire for Christ. And really, there's a greater desire for sin and the things of the world. And if we find ourselves in good and healthy soil, we don't get to boast in ourselves. We only get to boast in God, who's the one who has saved us, who opened our hearts, opened our, our ears to understand the gospel, and is continually at work in us, bearing and producing God-honoring fruit. And if this, is, if this is true of us, then we need to be praying for ourselves that this work will continue. Uh, and also, don't get discouraged when you fall, uh, because we will make mistakes. doesn't mean we're going to be sinless. Uh, but also, as we continue to grow, do not become prideful in our walk. Pride is never a fruit of the Spirit. And if we read this parable this morning and certain people come to mind today, this morning, don't leave here and forget about them. Pray for them. Pray for them today, and after you pray for them, pray for them some more. Because I genuinely believe that God doesn't put people, God does not put people on our hearts and our minds in vain. I believe He does so intentionally and in purpose. Not that it's a guarantee that everyone we pray for will come to faith in, in, in Christ, but we do know that there's power in prayer. Not not because of the words we say, but only because of the one 
who we pray to, there is saving power in him. So with that, let's pray.